Good evening, South Brunswick. Uh, I'm calling the meeting in order. Uh, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, there's a flag behind David. <laughs> Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. New Jersey Open Public Me Meeting Act was enacted to ensure the right of public to have advance notice of and to attend the meetings of public bodies of which any business affecting their interests is discussed or acted upon. In accordance with the provisions of this act, the board secretary has caused notice of, the, of this meeting, including date, time, location, to be posted in South Brunswick Public Library and the board office filed with the township clerk and communicated to the home news and the star ledger. Mr. Pulaski, can I get a roll call, please? Patrick Del Piano. Absent. Mr. Raymond Keener. Present. Mrs. Joyce Mehta. Yeah. Dr. Stephen Parker. Here. Mr. Devin Patel. Yeah. Mr. Arthur Robinson. Here. Mrs. Lisa Rogers. Here. Mr. Joseph Scaletti. Here. Mr. Barry Nathanson. Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, just for the public, Mr. Delapiano uh, informed us earlier he won't be able to attend this evening. Uh, approval of tonight's agenda. Can I get a motion? I'll move it. Mo moved by uh, Devin Patel, second by Dr. Parker. All in favor? Aye. Aye. A anyone opposed? Approval of minutes, board minutes of June 8th, at, uh, 2020. Can I get a motion? Motion to approve. Moved by Mr. Keener, second by Lisa Rogers. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Approval of board minutes of June 22nd, uh, 2020. And motion. So moved. Moved by Dr. Parker. A second. Second by Mr. Patel. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Feder, report to the superintendent. Yes. Hello, everybody. Uh, David, do we have Tabitha? Is she here today? I will find her. I do not Mascabetto. I do not see her in our list of. If I may say, she her term might be done. Right, this starts yeah. a new year. So, yep, her, her term is done. It is. Oh yeah. She's not in our list of attendees. We have 144 people um, in our list of attendees right now. Wow. All right. That's the largest group yet. Yeah. All right. Welcome, everybody, and thanks for attending this meeting. Um, today, we will be going over kind of where we are in the process of reentry, which I know is the big topic. But as um, I think Mr. Nathanson said, on August 4th, we will be presenting a final version with all the bells and whistles and all the pieces and all the answers to all the questions. And that's where we are. But, but I wanna just talk for a minute, kind of read you something I've been working on. And I, I, think, I think we're in a situation right now, which is probably even bigger than we're thinking. And we're thinking it's pretty big. We are up against situations that, I know the word unprecedented has been overused in the last four months but I'm gonna go with daunting or somewhat feels impossible on some days. Um, and it, the way I keep describing it is every time we come up with an answer, we seem to have five more questions about that answer. And we never seem to get to a place. And, and I talk about this puzzle. And I think I was talking to, to Dr. Parker last night. And right, Dr. Parker, we were talking last night, I think. I can't remember what day it was, but I think it was last night. And I think I figured out what we're doing. Here's what we're doing. We're putting together a white puzzle, a one color puzzle, 
and every piece is the exact same shape. That's what it feels like we're doing. And you just feel really good find one piece to connect to another piece. And then of course it could be two days later before you find the third piece to connect to the first two pieces. And what happens, you just never really feel like you're making progress. Now, with that said, we are making progress. We are, we are doing an amazing job because of the people that work in the district and the families that are supporting us and this board of education. That really is what it is. Now, this makes a snow day look like my favorite day of the year. Knowing on a snow day, I'm going to upset people if I don't close and upset a different group of people if I do close. That is the reality of a superintendent and the snow in the Northeast. Now imagine what we're doing now. I know for an absolute fact, whatever final plan this is, we're gonna have a contingency of people and we're going to have a contingency of people that are thrilled. If I said to the Board of Education right now, okay, everybody, listen, I thought about this, closing up shop. We cannot open. I need you to vote full virtual, period. We'll have some people right now cheering in their seats, and we'll have a no other section of people, probably about the same amount, who will come with pitchforks to the same exact party. Right? So that, that's the reality. So there's no right answer. So we have to then lean on safe, healthy as our best solution and what that looks like. Today is July 23rd. July 23rd. I don't know what the answer is going to be on September 8th. But I know we have a responsibility to our community and to our students and to our staff, which is make the best plans we can with the information we have that we believe keeps people as safe as we can in that environment. So the question becomes, can we do that? Can we actually open schools, in-person learning, and guarantee 100% safety? The answer is no. I tell you that right now. Just like I've told every single parent whose child has a food allergy during all my years as an administrator, I cannot guarantee your child will not come in contact with that food that they are allergic to. What I can do is I could build a ton of mitigating situations to keep that from happening to the best of our ability. Mr. Keener, one of our board members, he's in charge of the transportation from North Brunswick School District. And I guarantee you, he would never tell any parent, I can guarantee that none of our buses will ever get into a bus accident. Never say that, but we could put rules in place. We could train drivers. We can do everything under the sun to make it as safe as possible. So at some point, the question becomes, what are we willing, what are we able to mitigate? And is that enough? And that's a question every school district right now is answering. So tonight, when I get to that part and I go over where we are, just understand, I have issue with where we are now. I'm being honest with our community and with our board. It is July 23rd, it is not September 8th. And there's a few things that I believe need to happen before we know if we can safely open schools. And with that, I wanna read a little piece, an excerpt from something I'm working on right now Governor, tomorrow. This is, just, this is just a piece. It kind of outlines my idea of what needs to happen in the state to help. And I start off with, I don't start, this is a little piece. If it is deemed unsafe, impossible, or impracticable to follow the below suggestion, then this alone should be the deciding factor used to determine if schools can safely reopen in person learning in September. My suggestion is simple. Open up all statewide indoor venues at full capacity now, or as soon as practicable, but definitely leaving at least a month before school. If schools are to be open in September, the first step must be to reopen all other inside venues at full. That's dining halls, 
That's every single indoor venue there is. No more Zoom meetings for anybody. No legislator Zoom meetings, no boards of education Zoom meetings, nobody. You want to put 1.4 million children into schools? You better be able to open a dining hall before you do that. And when you open that dining hall, make sure we know how to manage that as a society. It has been stated many times by our governor and by many scientists that the virus is far more deadly inside than outside. So prior to sending every child and educator into closed indoor settings all at once, kind of like I'm visualizing, you know, 5,000 yellow school buses just dropping off students in 2,500 different schools. At the same time, five friends can't go see a movie together. You, you, you can barely get into a bowling alley. You, you can't use the indoors that we know. The contradiction of this is breeding anxiety by everyone involved. That's family, staff, and this is not a South Brunswick thing. These are contradictions that must be addressed before we open doors. We are not politically convenient. We educate kids and we need to protect the kids and the people that educate them. So I'll go on to read a little bit more. Um, where was I? So prior to sending every child and educator into closed indoor settings all at once, the reopening of all indoor venues will give a chance for our society to practice indoor safety measures and will give the state a chance to assess if we can control and coexist with the virus in indoor environments. If the opening of all indoor venues in full capacity across all facets of our state cannot or will not be done, then my, my, my request is then do not make the 1.6 million children and educators subjects of an experiment. I have written more. I'm not trying to upset the governor. I'm not trying to upset the legislator. We are in a position where we are responsible every day for 10,000 lives. And if we can't open the Cheesecake Factory, which is a gigantic restaurant, to even let 50 people in there to eat, how in the world are we opening 2,500 schools with 1.6 million people a day? Where are they gonna eat? Are they really gonna social distance? Rutgers is closed in full. My both of my daughters go to college, both of my kids won't see the inside of a classroom until I don't know when. That's in Connecticut and Pennsylvania. Go around anywhere in this area and you will find colleges that have made the statement. We don't believe that 118 to 25 year olds can safely be in a classroom. And cl you know, college classes are 50 minutes long, maybe an hour and 15 minutes. Why can't they open for in classes? My daughter can sit in a classroom with a mask on for 50 minutes six feet apart from someone else. And we know the rooms in those colleges are big enough to handle it. Why, why not? Because they've deemed it not worth the risk and nothing else is open. Every, every single state that's open, what's happened? Right now, the governor has put 32 states on a mandatory quarantine list. If you come back, 32. So while we are planning, and we are knocking ourselves out every minute of every day to build the best model we can, please understand, if we are still living in a situation where nothing else is allowed to be open, then we can't allow schools to be that first test case. It's too risky. And I'm not an, over, I don't, I'm not an alarmist. I'm not even remotely close to being an alarmist. But the contradic contradictions that we are seeing right now are problematic. And it's causing an anxiety because people want to know they are safe and their kids are safe. And there's nothing wrong with them wanting that. You want that. I know this board wants that. 
I know I want that. So I'm crafting this. I don't know where it will go. I think someone asked me, do you think you'll get a response? I think one of our administrators asked me that today. I don't know. I don't know. But what I know is in all the states that have opened up, such as Florida, Texas, and California, the virus surged and the death tolls rose. That we know. We're talking about over a thousand people dying a day right now. And we're still not opened for business in this state. And if we're gonna stay not open for business, schools have to be on that list of what can't open. The Department of Ed didn't say open with 25%. He didn't, they didn't say open with 50. They gave a vague 104 pages of, of, of words and left it up to 600 different districts to decide what it means. That's a huge problem in a state, huge problem, but that's the problem we're facing. And fine, we'll get through it. We'll do it well. We'll do it probably better than most, to be honest with you. But I implore our leaders to consider if you can't get a burger in a restaurant, can you really put 1.6 million people in buildings where they're going to sit for three to six hours in a sedentary environment and according to the Department of Education with masks off? According to the deal, we all repeat that. Students do not, they are not requiring students to wear masks when they're in their desks. It goes against every single piece of science that has been shared with us in the last four months, certainly in the last two months, certainly since that was made on June 26th. The contradictions from the Department of Ed, the contradictions in the way we're working as a state, I'm not even arguing. Let me be clear, and I apologize for not being clear. I'm not arguing. We are doing fantastic as a state as far as maintaining the virus. Fantastic. So I'm not, I'm not claiming we're doing it wrong. All I'm saying is if that's what's working, and why, why, why is it going to be the kids who get tested on? Let's see first. Stop doing Zoom meetings. Everybody stop doing Zoom meetings. Let's all the adults back in the buildings, wherever their buildings are and go from there. Devin, you, you're a, you work in um, a state office, correct? H how was the drive into work today, Devin? <laughs> so the state hasn't fully opened, right? Now maybe they will. No, they are not. They're working from home, yep. Working from home. Actually, matter of fact, I'm furloughed for two weeks. I'm still <laughs> saving some state money. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Unfortunately, hey, that's a lot of people. Unfortunately, that's not good either. But but it just play it out. If state buildings are closed, are we going to open before the state buildings open? Like really, six year olds, six feet apart, wearing masks, six hours a day, really? But Devin can't go. Devin, you better learn how to wear that mask, Devin. But yeah. Devin, <laughs> I do go there frequently with mask. <laughs> Right? I mean, adults can do it, but they're not even letting adults do it. So anyway, I, I'm not going to belabor. I'll, I'll, I'll give you some more points as we go. Um, it's important that we understand the situation we're in. And, and I know this board does. I'm not saying you all agree with me on this, but I, I know you understand. and that, that I appreciate. Even if we don't agree, which I, I, we might agree 100%. I'm not even saying we don't or do. I'm not asking. I'm just saying you know, as a person who has to ultimately make recommendations to the board, it is going to be very hard for me to make a recommendation to this board to open and follow those DOE guidelines if the state of New Jersey is not doing it themselves and has done it long enough to see what the outcome is. Because I'm not seeing any results from anywhere that's opened that looks very good yet. So that's my piece. I feel it's better to be honest with everybody, let you know where I am, and I'm doing it publicly. Um, I upset anybody. I knew that would be the case. Um, it's part of my job, unfortunately, as I know I upset sometimes half the people all the time. Sometimes I get a little lucky. I only upset 30% of the people some of the time. But I have to do what I believe is best for the, for the, for the kids in the district and for the safety of, our, 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 of all of us. So hoping things turn around, Hoping when I send the letter, it has some impact. 
hoping all the other letters that are being sent have an impact. I know this will not be the first. It won't even be the thousandth. And um, I won't send it until the board, you know, I, 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 since I speak on behalf of the board, I wouldn't do that alone. So I'll be giving you a copy of the letter before it gets sent and see if, you know, we have approval on that. Um, but let me go into the rest of my um, kind of opening today. We have, other, we have other things, believe it or not. We have other things that are happening other than just re-entry. I think we forget that. Like we, we were talking the other day, like, you know, a kid can actually just have, have a cold. Like that's allowed, right? You're still allowed to get a cold. Is that still allowed? Yeah, I guess you can still have a cold. You can just have a headache one day. I mean, that's allowed. It doesn't have to be, you know, a COVID reaction. It, it could really just be a headache. We forget everything, everything right now in my universe is COVID. My daughters, taking them to school, COVID, you know, uh, everything. There's nothing that's not right now. And so when something else comes in, you kind of forget that, oh my God, that's true. Wow, that's, that's real. We can do that. I do play golf a little bit. So Joe, I have played, I've gone out a couple of times, Joe. So that, that's, that's good. But even on a golf course, it's COVID. You drive your own cart. You can't touch anything. There's no water on the, I mean, every, everything right now, our world is this. So schools have to, so you're going to hear me talk about our plans, right? And we're going to still work on those all the way through and make sure we're ready. No matter what, we're going to be ready for solid remote. If we're remote, 100%, we'll be ready if we're in person. We'll be ready. So just know that, and I'll go over that. There's one thing we want to do to help us get ready. On August 4th, we're going to ask you to approve another calendar change for this year. And if you give me the go-ahead tonight, we'll send out notification to the families immediately so they know. And that is to change the calendar and have September 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and 4th be moving our PD days from the November. You know how we're closed for that November? Move the PD days to extend the opening with staff for September. So they have time to do whatever we need them, whatever's needed, right? Whatever, whatever they need to do. If we're in person, if we're not in person, whatever it is, we need time. And remember last year, we wanted to like lose five days off the calendar so that we'd have that time. Remember that? And we didn't get that. So we're going to have to, we, our, our recommendation is to chunk it and right up front at the school year. Uh, right now we would leave election day is still a uh, day of conferences, right, Jen? leave election day as conferences because we don't want kids present right. on election day. So election day, no students, um, and it will be parent teacher conference. So um, it's a simple, it's a simple look. And um, let me know if you, if you want to think about it a little bit, we can talk about it later in the night, if that seems fine. It does allow parents and families to wait until after labor day to start. So the first day of school would be the Tuesday after labor day for kids instead of before labor day. But this, this is something that we've worked with um, our teachers on, our teachers union on this, the SBEA, um, who I, I just want to say have, have been extremely cooperative. Oh, the cooperative is the wrong word. They're always cooperative. I, I don't even mean that. We're working together collaboratively is the right word uh, on trying to do things. And, and I know our teachers have major concerns about coming back. Uh, I, I don't blame a single person for having concerns. Um, so just... Just know that this, this calendar um, has already gone through a bit of a process. If you guys approve of it, we'll get it moving. Um, Mr. Nathans, do you want to ask now, or would you guys prefer to think about that? It's not on the motion for tonight, so I just would like a kind of a straw poll go ahead. Lisa? Yeah, um, Devin, I'm going to defer to actually Devin. Devin, we discussed this, right, Mr. Chairman, in the curriculum committee. So maybe you want to comment. You have to take yourself off mute. Yep. Yep, absolutely. Sorry, Lisa. Yes, I was going to say that too. Yes, Lisa, that we did discuss this last week at our cur curriculum committee meeting, and we all uh, came on the same agreement that, yeah, it's a good idea to have it this way so the teachers can have their PD days and we can uh, give more times to key teachers for reentry. So I agree with the whole plan. Uh, Jen? I was just going to say, if I can add for the rest of the board members in your portal, those minutes are there. So you, if you want to just see it visually, you have a resource at your fingertips to see it. And Joyce was part of that meeting too. So Joyce, do you have any comment on that? 
and Lisa. Mr. Nathanson, can we ask for a straw poll? Well, yeah, uh, the rest of the board, if you want to chime in, if you want to read those minutes first, we don't have to do it this evening. It's up to you guys. I think we can go ahead and do it. Ray, is that okay? Then, then Mr. Would... President, I'm in favor of that as well. Okay. I would think somebody on the committee then ought to make a motion. Get right. it seconded. I was going to uh, suggest Devin. All right, so Mr. Nathanson, I um, motions to uh, change those calendar date change from uh, taking out those uh, uh, November days and moving for in front in September, so that we can have those uh, PD days for teachers and start okay. start days from on September eighth. Good. Can I get a second, please? I second. A second as by as... Lisa Rogers. All in favor? Joyce. Of the voice. <laughs> it's a star poll, so all in favor? You can uh, just raise your hand. Or, you know, that's fine. So you got it, Scott. All right, thank you, everybody. I'll keep moving on. Um, we're moving ahead with the device initiative. Um, I know I, I have a letter going to the governor that says, think about some of this before we do anything. But I also wanna, wanna say thank you to the governor who made a commitment to stopping the digital divide. And he has just sent out a grant for us, well, all districts to fill out, to let them know what we need so uh, Sharon Johnson is like a kid in a candy store right now. She is looking at our needs for students, you know, and, and, and MiFi so that everybody has Wi-Fi. So um, the problem is only going to be, can we get the materials this quick? Because the rest of the state will also be looking to order the same exact equipment. And so that's going to be a, a challenge. But Sharon, 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 Sharon's a good fighter and a good negotiator. So I, I, I put my money on Sharon that we'll get some stuff. So Scott, uh, yes. Based on those grants, the state is not facilitating purchases, doing some kind of group purchase through the state. Um, I mean, maybe that's what they'll wind up doing. So I'm not sure. We just got it today, and um, Sharon will work with David at the end of the day, and, and some of our other central office team to figure it out. But what I, I just wanted to give kudos to to that because it's going to be very helpful um, for for our needs. All right, Bear? Yep. Um, surveys uh, were uh, completed today. I'll just let you know our family survey did have 3,681 response. Nice. response. Nice. So that's a pretty high one. I'm going to go over some results for you when I do the next presentation. Uh, another great number our reentry forums. Our last reentry forum was the high school families. I think we had a bunch of kids on there. Uh, we probably had staff, we had families, we had a thousand attendees. And it's funny, I, I've been getting the question of that question of how can you keep having Zoom meetings in opening school? And I get that question, but I don't think I'm going to change the forums, even if we're COVID free. I think the idea of it's a been a, it's been a great way to reach families and reach staff. We've had very large staff numbers that we don't usually get that large on things either. It makes it more manageable. Can you guys all hear the noise? If you can, I apologize. I, I do not get to control the weather. And uh, that is lightning and thunder and rain. Um, I'm over in Millstone. So if you don't have it yet in South Brunswick, it might be coming. Um, so we have more forums coming in August. I'm sure they'll be well, well received because by then we'll have announced everything and there'll be a lot of questions for people. Well, we'll be able to explain what it all means clearly. And we think there'll be a lot of questions from families and from staff. So we're doing another set of forums after August 4th as well. So we thought that was important. Um, letting you know, we're still meeting as our district reentry committee. We have another meeting tomorrow. Then we have another meeting Tuesday. Um, you'll probably all heard, there is a guaranteed remote only option for, for students. That was a, uh, a push. The superintendents, a bunch of superintendents made after hearing that that right was gonna be taken away from families. So uh, we're glad that that was overturned quickly and moving along. Uh, I'll talk more about transportation at, our, at, our, at, at the presentation. Please, 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 kindergartners, kindergartners, kindergartners. We need kindergartners. Find one. Anything you need to do, knock on the doors. Maybe the board members, if you guys can go out, knock on the doors and ask if they have a kindergartner 
and you know, do what you have to do, people. We got everyone's got to work on this one. Please, anyone listening to this, get us kindergartners. Tell people who have kindergarten age kids to register. They can always choose to change their mind, but register. It really is going to make a difference for us as we staff everything. Whether we're remote or not, we still need to know who our kids are. So please, whoa, that was a bad one. Um, unfortunate news, it looks like the senior picnic is not going to take place this year. It's just, it's just all sad. I mean, we, we just feel awful for these kids. And they're going right into, the ones that are going into college, they're going into just, just a situation that just doesn't feel like college. And just the hits keep on coming, but the world, the hits keep coming. Look at what's happening around the country. 60, 70,000 new cases, 1,000 new deaths a day. You know, we're just, it's, we're not out of this yet. And if, if we're listening to, to, to Fossey, he keeps talking about it's going to get worse. The epidemiologists think it's going to get worse. The president actually said that it's going to get worse. So knowing it's going to get worse, it just adds to the stress of our families and our staff, right? Everyone's telling you it's going to get worse. Open up schools in a month and a half. Ah, it's crazy. It's, it's crazy. Um, August 4th, everybody, August 4th, important board meeting. That's going to be like the unveiling uh, of this plan at that point. So that, that's all I have, um, Mr. Nathanson, but I do want to reintroduce one of our longtime speakers, uh, David, can you find Marty Abschutz somewhere in the audience? I've located Marty and I'm going to provide him an opportunity to talk. All right, Marty, Ed Foundation. Thank you, Mr. Fetter. Uh, good evening, South Brunswick, members of the board and administration. Uh, was a, Mr. Fetter, you gave me a perfect lead into my topic when you talked about stress because I'm going to talk about a possible stress reliever. Uh, most of you know that this year we are not having the actual Tour de South Brunswick and Foundation fund work, but we've gone virtual. So you can sign up on our website, uh, report your miles, whether you're walking or you're cycling. And uh, right now we're probably averaging over 700, 700 miles a, uh, a week. We started this project on uh, June 15th. It goes until August 15th and we'll report back uh, to the board and the community on how many miles we have when we're done. Uh, there are lots of walkers and uh, cyclists and it's aside from being healthy, it's a good stress reliever also. Uh, so we have 145 participants right now which uh, is a little bit down from uh, when we have the actual tour. We've had six, seven, eight hundred people participate. So we'd like to see a lot more people participate. All you need to do is click on the link to register and then click on the link uh, later on to report your miles. Uh, we decided not to charge a fee. So it's absolutely free, but we can donate. There's a button to donate once you go onto the registration page. So again, it's, uh, it's open until August 15th and uh, get out there and ride your bike, walk, run, whatever, whatever you want to do to relieve that stress. And of course, if you are biking, make sure you wear your helmet and you protect your forehead. Thank you, Mr. Fetter and uh, members of the board. Thank you, Marty. Uh, Mr. Davidson, back to you, which probably means it's back to me, but back to you first. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Fetter. Uh, so we're going to move along to the public comment. I'm going to read the statement. Uh, Board of Education recognizes the value of public comment on educational issues and the importance of allowing members of the public to express themselves on school matters of community interest. Complete copies of, this, of the rules that govern this portion of the meeting can be obtained in advanced copy by contacting the board office during regular business hours. We reserve the right to limit each speaker to more than three minutes. It is our plan to listen to each member of the public. We will note all questions and comments made. Once all questions and comments from all members of the public are made, the Board of Education will respond if necessary to a question or 
comments in the most timely and efficient manner available. Please consider not repeating comments and questions made by other members of the public. I ask that you state your name, place of residence, or group affiliation. Uh, can I get a motion to open to the public? Mr. Nathanson, before you do a yeah. motion, no motion. Would you guys prefer for me to do a presentation on the reentry before the public comment? <clears throat> comment on the public comment? comment oh, we'd like to do it after the public comment. I'm, I'm okay either way. I just realized that might be out of place. I, I want to make sure you do what you guys want. Any thoughts? Cool, guys. I say we stick to the agenda. Let the, let, let the public okay. go. Also, yeah. uh, Mr. Nathan, probably. we don't need a motion to open up uh, public yeah. comment. You approve the agenda. Yeah, I asked for that. Can I, uh, Mr. Parker, you, you made that motion. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Keenan. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Mr. Plasky, any uh, buddy pre sign up? No, we don't have any pre-registrations. Okay. I do have uh, John Lolly with a hand up. Uh, okay. We'll provide him an opportunity to talk. Very good. John, go ahead. Thank you. John Lolly, President, South Brunswick Education Association. Uh, the South Brunswick Education Association has listened closely to the legitimate concerns of our community, staff, and students, and we would like to speak to them this evening as we near the start of a new school. Throughout the last few weeks, SBA has been cl working closely with district administration to discuss what is in the best interest of all of our stakeholders' health and safety. We, we recognize the very difficult position district administration has been put in as the state has mandated that all school buildings reopen in the fall or risk losing substantial funding. The district has gone to great lengths to create a model that includes responsible social distancing, disinfection protocol, and limitations to the exposure of both students and staff. However, at this time, SBA believes that no in-person model can ensure the health and safety of students, staff, and their families. Given the recent data provided by the experts regarding the return to in-person learning, it is clear that it is not safe for students and staff to return to school buildings in September and believe that a strong distance learning model in the fall can best educate students while maintaining a safe environment. New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut are in a very different situation than we were back in April. Now we are seen as a model for other states that have erred in their handling of the pandemic and are combating record-breaking surges. Uh, we have made the strides we have because we have been cautious, prudent, and careful. We need only to look at Texas, Florida, California, and many other states now in the throes of record-breaking surges as hospitals reach capacity to remind us that our lives and the lives of our loved ones must always be of the utmost importance. As caregivers and providers, we have a responsibility to our own families, parents, and children. As educators, we have a responsibility to our students' education as well as to their health and safety. We, emph we empathize with and recognize the hardships that working parents face with remote learning, as these har hardships are shared by a great many teachers who struggle to both instruct their students as well as their own children from home. However, a return to school cannot guarantee the health and safety of our students or the safety of our own families during this global pandemic. Teachers are desperate to be back in school with their kids, uh, students, kids, uh, but we collectively recognize that by forcing our loved ones into a public environment such as school is anything but prudent and cautious. While we await further guidelines and decisions from the governor's office and the Department of Education, we will continue to work alongside administrators and parents to ensure all of our families and loved ones are safe and as healthy as possible. In the meantime, we strongly encourage parents, teachers, and members of the community who likewise feel it is not responsible to return to in-person instruction to contact their state legislature and make sure their voices are heard. We are hopeful that the governor and the Department of Education will recognize the difficulties and the dangers of returning to our school buildings and look forward to working together to achieve the best distance learning models, models that ensure that all of our students' educational needs are met while maintaining the safety and health of the entire South Brunswick community. We all know that children cannot learn unless they are first safe. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Thank you. Any other hands up? 
Yes, I have um, Shurish uh, Jadwar. Hello, uh, I am Shrish Jawadawar. Uh, can, can everyone hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay. Uh, I am an alumnus of the South Brunswick schools, um, not really affiliated with any particular organization, but um, having been through school and all, I, I do wonder uh, if even having, you know, I was, I listened to the, the high school uh, thing on Monday that happened, the, the Zoom call about information. And I, I do wonder about a few things. One, that, you know, can we even risk letting even a single student get sick or, or worse? And if the answer to that is no, then is there, is there really even a way to get students to actually social distance? Because I, you know, from what I remember going through school when I was six years old, it was impossible to keep us quiet. I, I, don't, I don't know how they would be able to keep us apart uh, without affecting them in other ways, particularly through their mental health. But also that um, in, the, in the high school in particular, I remember that traveling from the annex building to the main building was probably the most congested experience and I've driven in New Jersey. And I would say probably that was more congested. So I, I wonder how we would manage such, you know, congested traffic in the schools if they were open, even to say half capacity. So uh, I do urge the board, if if possible, to uh, ensure that schools can stay closed. And if if they should be open at all, it should be just for those who have no other way. So, for example, if if uh, we have students of essential workers or uh, special needs students who have no other way of really learning, then we should limit uh, the school's reopenings to people who have no other way to, to learn other than in person. So uh, I thank the board for your time and uh, good night and thank you so much. Thank you. Swish. Thank you, Swish. I appreciate it. Uh, I don't see any other hands, Mr. Blasky. Is that correct? Dave, you're, you're on pause. You're, you're on mute, Dave. You're on the... Uh, gotcha. Uh, I have one. Uh, yeah, Dave. Mavin. Yeah. Mavin. Hi, this is Mavin, and thank you for taking my question. Mm -hmm. um, I did attend uh, Mr. Federer's presentation on the high school, and one of the things that didn't get addressed is that grading would be the same, but people who are at home, students at home, would have a somewhat advantage to the students coming into the school, and that should be addressed. And one of the reasons that for marking period four, the high school gave a pass fail was that <clears throat> they didn't think that uh, the grading would be fair and there was uh, opportunities for cheating. So that needs to be addressed uh, if we're going to have the dual model. It looks like everybody, and even Mr. Federer seems to be uh, reluctant to open the schools and it's really not safe to open the schools. I hope that they don't open. That's my trust open, but uh, we need to look at the grading differences that would arise. Thanks, Maveen. I'll get back to you on your email. Sorry to get back to you yet. Uh, we, have, we have some plans for that. I'll show you something, okay? Any other hands? No, I don't see any. I have no other hands. David, can I ask, um, well, we we'll can close public comment. Then, Ms. Nathanson, at the end of public comment, I'd like to give um, Elaine McGrath the floor. Oh, okay. Allow her to give us an update on athletics. It's, a, it's an ever-changing uh, environment out there. If you don't well, want to Do you want to leave public open so they can ask questions after Elaine, or what do you want to do, Scott? Dave, what do you want? Just close. Uh, okay, we'll, we'll close it. Uh, motion yeah. to close. Make the motion to close public portion. Yeah. Move by Ray Keener. I have a second. Second by Lisa Rogers. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay.
Okay, publish close. Elaine, Elaine, McGrath. Elaine, can you raise your hand, Elaine? And there you are. Yeah, I already got her. Can you also, if she wants to be on camera, can you undo her? Cannot. Okay, Elaine, you're, you you're go? going dark, Elaine. No wife. problem. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, we start Monday, um, July 27th, with football coming in. Uh, four days, Monday through Thursday. Uh, they're running two sessions because of the requirement of phase one. Phase one requires uh, students to complete a covert questionnaire, one time only. Uh, we already have well over 300 student athletes uh, completed it. And then they'll uh, report in uh, for workouts in a kind of like a parade in, just like we did the book collection and everything else at the high school, because they're required to complete a daily COVID uh, check-in uh, form on a Google form, as well as a temperature check. So we have two stations. They also have to be checked that they have a mask with them. They have to be in the mask anytime they're not in physical exertion. They have to make sure they have ample water because we don't have any except emergency bottles of water available for students. Go through check one. If you've already approved to move on, then you move to station two, which is your temperature check while you sit in the car and you're either good to go or um, you go home. Each uh, student athlete is put in a pod of 10 and they will work uh, six feet apart. And each group has to be 12 to 18 feet apart uh, in order to work. So thank goodness we have 77 acres. I wouldn't mind adding a little bit more, Barry, if you got some. Uh, so <laughs> spread out all over the place. Uh, but uh, this week coming up is just football. So we're talking about 87 kids coming. And then the following week, it's a, a kind of phase in. Everybody has a shot um, in a time starting at 7 a.m. in the morning. Um, those teams will be working out uh, twice a week, whether it's a Monday, Wednesday or thir uh, Tuesday, Thursday schedule. And each program has to go through phase one for two weeks. And if a student doesn't make it on the first day, their clock doesn't start. So let's say your son or daughter doesn't show on the 27th, but decides to come August 3rd. That's their first day of phase one, and they have to do two weeks of that phase before they move on to phase two. Uh, in phase one, there's really no um, equipment outside of physical equipment, which are ladders and cones and possibly a um, dumbbell or a um, medicine ball that has to be cleaned after each student athlete handles it. Fortunately, we have enough dumbbells to go around. So coach has it all laid out that the kids could have it, but that will be phased in probably towards the end of the week. So we're looking at athletes who haven't been working out in person with us since March 13th when we went out. So it's like kind of start over, see where they are and go very cautiously. We're timed. We're not allowed to work out over uh, 90. Uh, I think this one is 60 minutes, but we have the kids in for 90 because we know it's gonna take us time to get them in, get them tested, get them covered, do the workout and then come up to the pick out area, uh, pick up area where they have to uh, be picked up and then transported off of campus. This is only outside only uh, volleyball and gymnastics are not allowed in the gym as, as, as well as everybody else. And possibly we're gonna see that in phase two, we can go in wearing a mask and spreading out six feet apart on gymnastics equipment and in our gyms. So that's where we are. Um, some schools, I'm sure if you followed on Twitter, started uh, July 13th. Um, in talking to all the coaches, we were doing a slower approach because we wanted to make sure we had everything set. We wanted to make sure we had our COVID questionnaire set up and kids have response uh, to it because it's a little different pattern than we've run in the past. Usually summer workouts are a little bit more casual. Like if you plan a vacation, we understand you go away. And our start dates are generally targeted at August 10th and August 17th. Uh, 
as it was laid out, but that's all pushed back to September 14th as the NGSIA official start of the season. So we're gonna go through phase one, phase two, and there's gonna be a phase three that we'll only probably get about one week in. And then we go on a two, two week hiatus starting September 1st. We're not allowed uh, contact with the kids and only in virtual. So from September 1 to September 14th, uh, we'll be in virtual contact with our teams. And then when we return on the 14th, we're allowed to practice as a unit. And most of the uh, start dates for games are pushed back to August, I mean, October 1st for football, the first Friday in October. And we have all adjusted schedules. So what was up online is all changed at this point because the start dates have been dropped. Football schedule came out. It's a six game football schedule and everybody else is probably in uh, an eight to 10 game schedule if we can fit it because the season is so much shorter. <laughs> Six weeks is basically what we're looking at. You may ask questions. questions. You know, I'd Go ahead, ahead Ben. They're getting together to work out. It's not for practices, correct? That's all this oh. is basically is workouts and get their strength and conditioning done. It's worded, uh, Mr. Keener, that you work out. You can do a drill, but you cannot have contact as long as it's in a drill fashion. And yeah, we're so not using all, any balls. So it's all agility, correct? I mean, is that what Basically, that's what we're going to do. Uh, in phase two, you can add a ball that can be thrown, um, caught, handed off, um, dribbled uh, <laughs> and cleaned. <laughs> hey, Elaine, Elaine, let me throw out a question for you to shed some light on something. I, I was reading the other day and you corrected me when I said to you that, hey, I just read that all that the governor's releasing so we can now do contact sports for youth. And I said, I didn't realize that was happening. And what was, the, what, what did you, what was your response to me? And what is the reality of that? The reality is no, it's not an NJSIA rule that governs high school athletics. There's a difference, there's like three, three different categories. There's a youth category, which covers like Pop Warner, our town team. And then there's an NJSIA level, which covers uh, high schools in the state of New Jersey, and then the NCAA. So we're all required to find, um, to follow the rules of our governing body. Okay, so, so in other words, the... South Florida students who play for what team in the, in the well, give me an example of a team run by the, the township or a club team or something. Well, uh, any club soccer. Okay. So, uh, so is there a club soccer happening right now? Yes. Okay. So if, so if this was soccer season and we had 20 kids who are on our school soccer team, they're allowed to play in their club sport and they're allowed to play, even touch the ball really in school right okay Thank you. <laughs> yes miss oh, hi, hi, hi elaine hi. Um, quick question and either scott or you can answer um a while ago correct me if i'm wrong um there was an issue regarding obtaining the forms the doctor's signature forms that's all been rectified or is that still outstanding uh, as far as our physical forms, are you speaking of? I think yeah. physical forms. Our physical forms are posted on our website that can be downloaded at any time. Um, we're presently collecting physicals at, from the high school students, 9 through 12. We haven't done anything with middle school as of yet. Um, we collect them Tuesday between 8 o'clock and 11 o'clock in the morning. Outside the trainer's room, there's a box, and we've had a nurse there kind of reviewing the forms with the parents to make sure they're completed correctly. Um, and then we uh, review them, send them out to the district doctor. So we have been collecting. Okay, so Scott, the, the government has not eliminated that step. We, we, it would be our choice. We, we're not eliminating the step, even if the government says. Our okay, good very clear. We're not putting kids on the field because it's convenient to erase 
the the the, the liability. I don't understand it. Like, why why would you ever pass liability of children's health? And this is all going in the it's, you know, it's all just going in the same bucket. It, it, political convenience is not an answer when it comes to schools. It's just not an answer. So the idea of even passing or even putting a bill in front of legislators as well, it's really hard to get these appointments now. So let the kid go for a year without a physical. So in other words, so then have these physicals ever been necessary? Right. What about a kid that had COVID? They're, st they're still not sure of the impact of long-term impact. So what about a kid that had it four months ago who had a physical last year, right? Just play this out. So now there's no physical to see and that child could just come and start playing a, a, a fall sport. Why would that be? So our position as a district was no way. So one of the questions that we are asking though, is have you or anyone in your household have COVID? Correct. Part, part of the original Thank you. Thank you. As well as have you traveled out of state to any of the areas that have restricted travel within the last 14 days? Great, thanks Elaine. Okay. Any other questions, Elaine? Elaine, I have a couple uh, before that. Okay. So, uh, obviously, we would have to go to contact prior to games in October today. We're not going to contact to September now? Is that what it amounts to? Um, they haven't published uh, Phase 3 or Phase 4, but we're not going to make it to Phase 4 based on our start time. So, uh, by the 14th, it's the start of the season. So you would be able to go to your, um, you know, 30 minutes of contact a week, which is what they've had in the past, unless there's been some adjustment made. So this, the fall season includes in, some indoor sports. What are they doing? Uh, they're outdoor. They're going to come in on August 3rd and start training outdoors. Um, at least do workouts and everything out there, which is volleyball, uh, uh, cheerleading, and gymnastics. Um, and then once we get to phase two, we're allowed to go in, but then there's certain things you can do in phase two. Um, and um, that's what we're, we'll be going in a slow process to make sure we're doing it the right way. Well, volleyball and gymnastics, uh, are almost a bigger concern than uh, football. Volleyball, they're next to each other. You can't social distance once they start full practice. And gymnastics obviously are on mats, uh, on different uh, gymnastic devices. Do they have to, are there rules that how constant that has to be cleaned and everything too? Well, they uh, haven't got to that point yet. We haven't got to the indoor point yet of what we're cleaning. Uh, the indoor rules where we could go in, we'd have to wear masks unless we're doing, um, you know, exer exertion. And um, for me, I, I think we would clean it after everybody's on it. We have um, bought um, clear gear, which you can spray right on your equipment and you just give it some time to dry. And then the next person, we're just gonna have to go very slow and make sure we're just doing the best we can for the kids. And fans, no fans, some fans. Uh, well, oh, they right. haven't got to that point yet. Not at well, games yet. <laughs> well, we're required to um, stay within that 500. That has not changed. Okay. Um, so we haven't really talked about how we would handle it, but um, you know, moving forward, I probably would talk to Peter and Scott about how we would handle our crowd of whatever we're supposed to be doing, um, and then we'd have to talk about all the personal changes, like I don't want to be trading money and have people taking that and changing tickets. And there's a lot to go into hosting that event. So oh, yeah. some people are talking about there's no fee this year and everybody's very limited on who can attend. Uh, right now, the BCC, which is where we play football, the big uh, central conference has said no marching band travels and no cheerleading travels. That was my next question, actually. Did they change the, are they changing the conference to to make the games closer? We're not going to, 
Are we going to Monmouth County, things like that, or is it going to well, be for us, for us, it looks uh, not a, a very good schedule because we're playing East Brunswick, Old Bridge. We're in Middlesex County playing Middlesex County teams, mostly red division. Uh, JFK, I mean, J.P. Stevens is probably our longest haul going up to Edison um, in there. So we're in a six-game GMC group right now. So we don't have to travel to the extent of others. Good. Okay, Ray, you had some questions? Yeah, I was just, Elaine, if you could, for the people out there, I know that there was an event last week that was held. And if you could just tell everybody that or reassure them that it wasn't an NJSAI AA sanctioned event. It was held by an outside agency. Explain exactly so the people know and they don't draw their own conclusions. They know exactly what that event was. Are, are you talking about the uh, last dance baseball? Correct. Okay. Last dance baseball falls under that category of youth sports because even though it involves uh, high school playing athletes, they're under uh, what they call, um, I think they called it the AAU, it's like an AAU team, and they exist on different rules. So they were able to play um, a number of games for kids to do it, like a summer league, and were able to play. There were a number of teams that withdrew from the tournament because of COVID concerns, uh, Carteret, um, J.P. Stevens, uh, and two Shore Conference teams. So there were some issues throughout the tournament, and um, there had been, uh, I know I read one article in Central Jersey that they were complaining there weren't people wearing masks at the, a lot of the masks okay. weren't being worn. So um, they had their issues, but a lot of kids uh, participated, yes. Okay, Joe, you had a question? Yeah, no. Yes, Elaine. Um, are all these sports besides just football, is everything else going to be played basically inside Middlesex County this year, or are they traveling far away? Um, most of it will be an adjusted schedule for our division. So you take the boys' soccer schedule. The thought is we'll probably go – there's eight teams in the red division, so we'll probably have a seven-game, seven- to eight-game schedule. Uh, the focus not being on any kind of division championship, um, it would be – we got to play some games and we got to compete about others. So that's how we're approaching it in, in uh, the greater Middlesex conference. Um, at this time, we're not talking about any County tournaments at all because we don't think we have enough time to run them. And at this point, the state is at least last time they came out, they were talking about running uh, some kind of sectional, but a very different tournament than you, you've ever seen. So maybe uh, just, just for instance, it might say, okay, East Brunswick, uh, South Brunswick, Old Bridge, and North Brunswick get together. Now you're central, you're going to be Central Jersey Group for soccer, and you would play. So they were going to kind of keep it close and small type tournament to run for their sectionals. And everybody, right now, everybody who wanted to be involved in any kind of NGSIA sectional game would get in regardless of their record if they so choose. Cool. I also seen this uh, tonight that uh, Carteret has shut down all their fall uh, sports. Is there any other teams in Middlesex County that you've seen do this yet? Or are they no, the first? They're the first ones. Okay. okay, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, Devin. So, uh, how about cross countries and, and on those kind of sports? Uh, it's, uh, are, are they still on? Yes. Every sport is on that we have uh, in the fall. Um, and they'll each come up uh, with an opportunity to run um, August 3rd. They start their program, whatever day um, Coach Rivera picked and has put out. He has had a classroom going around for the kids. Each program has had uh, Google Classrooms. So everybody's up on, you know, what we're doing, and they've had team talks. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you, Elaine. I appreciate you coming tonight. Okay. Have a great day. Thanks, Elaine. Yep. All right. Too. Thank you, Elaine. Mr. Nathanson, can I give yeah. a quick um, a quick yeah, run through? Ahead. I give a quick run through of. 
it's not really much new information from the forum. Right. Before you start, Scott, you have a uh, you have another meeting of the committee on Friday tomorrow yeah. too. Okay. Yep. Okay. Go ahead. Thanks. So just, just you heard me talk about kind of where our heads are. My head is right now. Um, the reality is right now there's so many unknowns. Uh, there's a lot we don't we don't know yet, and there's a lot we're waiting for. We've asked questions. I have a series of questions into the special education assistant commissioner of education. I sent that about uh, seven to ten days ago. Haven't received a response, but it's very important information we need about how to do certain things with special needs students. So, um, our director, Mr. Morales, and I put that together. Uh, still, no response. Um, we talked about the anxiety. Uh, we talked about the fact that we have, you know, so many people working on this. Teacher groups coming in. Uh, people, I, I have staff all the time sending me ideas and thoughts. It's been very helpful. There's a lot of people involved. Um, <clears throat> the reality is things continuously change. We just heard from Elaine, and you were asking about this sport, that sport, this date, this date. It, it, it would not shock me at all if everything she said changes long before September. Not because of Elaine, but because of the fluidity of the situation we're in, especially with the idea of contact sports. But it is really another one of those contradictions. Well, why why can the same kids play in a club team, but they can't play in school? Why should they be playing on a club? How are we allowing that and not allowing the other things? So it's just a constant situation we're in. But we get questions all the time, and we kind of throw up our hands. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, we don't know the answers to those questions. This is an important component. Right now, I've calculated about 50 different times that the DOE guidance, their suggestion for a solution is spend money. For example, my favorite one I think I shared the other day is build sidewalks so you don't need as many buses. Literally told us to build sidewalks if anyone knows anything about the sidewalk behind the high school to the target center, that's, I think that was in the works before I started here. Three, three plus year project to get a sidewalk. The Department of Education's guidance is to build sidewalks by September 1st. First of all, we can't afford a sidewalk. And if we could afford a sidewalk, you're looking at 21, 22, 22, 23 before that thing comes into play. The other things they've asked us to do are replace all of your furniture that isn't meant for one person. R replace our furniture. We have 8,500 students worth of furniture. So if we have tables that are meant for more than one person, the guidance says one of your strategies is replace, explore replacing it and buying other furniture. So the PPE alone David mentioned it. He got us started about $100,000 spent already. Not going to get us through <laughs> that long. Um, it, it's, I have a list so, so far of the things that are just impossible for us to afford. One of the other suggestions is a, a paraprofessional on every bus. <laughs> How are we doing that? I, I agree it's a good idea. Like I agree we should do that. If we're going to open, we need to do every single thing possible to keep people safe. But they're not affordable scenarios. They're just not, especially for a district that's already starting $2 million in the hole. So it's just important you understand that. The, the, the angst, the anxiety, the frustrations are real. And you, know, you heard it from John Lolly, the president of the SBEA. We have a faculty that wants to come back to work. There, there's nobody I know that wants to stay home anymore. I cannot stand, I'm selling my couch as soon as I can. Or I'm going to throw it out and just let, let, let the birds have it. I never want to see this couch again. I mean, we're done. Today's the 13 hours of Zoom today. I mean, it, it's, it's done. But at the same time, we have to make sure we can do it safely and that it is even possible to do it. That's the question. Is it even possible? With all the money in the world, is it possible to do it safely? Maybe, maybe, maybe if we had a lot of other things in place, I don't know. Um, and then the mandate issue I mentioned before, the reality is we have 
600 school districts who, who will be making 600 different decisions. And what, what that's doing is it's causing families, st staff and families who know other, other staff and other families in other districts to question why, it is, why, why can this district do this and you're not doing this? And I try to remind everybody, no one's doing anything yet. There's not one person who's done anything. All we've done is build models. No one's implemented anything yet. Really minimal, maybe the stuff for, for, for that Elaine was talking about for, for athletes, but you're talking about very small numbers. So districts are doing what they feel is best where their communities with how their interpretations are. And that's what it's gonna be. It's gonna be a collection of 600 different versions of this model, of a model. So let me keep moving on. I just wanna share you, we did the survey. I shared with you how many we had, like 3,600. This is interesting and you guys should know this. This is very informative, but at the same time, this was just a survey. I don't expect these numbers to hold when people have to make the decision, the final decision the numbers could go up, the numbers could go down. But it's fair to, to start with something. Parents who responded, they'll be not sending their students to school for in-person learning, as long as we're providing the learning, which we will. 54% of our elementary, 50% of our high school, and 40, 50% of our middle, and 45% of our high school. Is that a staggering number or what? Staggering. The model preference, they didn't really care too much if we went what I mean by model preference, week on, week off. Come on a Monday and a Wednesday and a Friday, one week, a Tuesday and Thursday the next week. Come every other day. Come two days, then two days off. The, the answers from all from the high school and the middle school were relatively consistent, not much of a margin of error of no preference, one model or the other model. And the, high, the elementary, and, and I understand the elementary families, it's probably easier to manage your job, if you can tell your employer, I'll work one week on and I'll work one week off. So that was the most popular, by enough of a margin to count it in the elementary school. So that's important and informs us as we continue to build. Some core components, if people missed the, the, um, the forums, um, PPE and health and safety remain our main focus and our most challenging situation, how to do it safely. We keep hitting roadblocks. Today we worked for, I think it was two or three hours on arrival with 50 administrators. 50 administrators looking at arrival. And what did we solve? We came up with good questions that we have to answer. And that's how it's going. And, and that's kind of the flow of things. You spend a lot of time on it, you, you get hit back, you move forward, you get hit back, you move forward, then you finally get to a place where it's like, okay, that, that's, that's good, we can do that. Um, make sure everyone knows, again, every parent knows, mandatory masks. Even though the Department of Education has said that students do not need to wear masks inside, we're not buying that. I don't even understand it. You have to wear masks inside, period, the end. We will figure out ways to build in breaks and manage it, but the code of conduct is gonna be that students will wear masks, they will social distance. And I have faith in our community, I have faith in our kids, I have faith in our staff, that we will do a good job of that if it's even possible. But let's think of the reality. Is it really, is it a reality to have even 10 or 12 kindergartners in a room for four hours? Is that, is that really possible to social distance and to wear a mask? I don't know. I don't know. I don't think any of us think it's possible, but maybe we're wrong and we'll give it a try if we have to. This is the way we have to go. And we have the right, the right data says that we could open, we'll give it a go but you know, that's really skeptical. All of our sessions will be four hour days at this point. We'll reevaluate that if things change. In all of our models, some kids are in school, some kids are out of school. We're looking at what we're calling our tier one kids. And these are students that we believe are less likely to, have, uh, to learn in a remote environment. We wanna give those kids more attention, give them more opportunities for in-person learning if that's what's required. We're still looking at how we can help families with remote learning centers which is giving a place for a student to come to do their remote work because parents have to work, first responder families, things like that, where we have to be helpful to our community. There is a remote only option that's available as we talked about. And all the things we're doing, we're gonna phase in. So we're not just gonna 
throw 50% of our kids in one time on the school district, we're gonna make sure we do this methodically, support new students, support people coming to new schools and make sure we're in good shape. If you could just envision you know, 40 buses at the high school dropping off kids while there's a row of parents coming, dropping off kids when no one really knows what to do. We had some really good ideas on how to do that. And we think we're good. I think one of the things I remember hearing this morning is make sure that we send home visuals and some videos for parents to use with their kids so that they know exactly what the expectations look like and are. Good idea. We can do all that. There's stuff we can do. At some point, it just keeps coming. Is this, is this really going to happen? Is it really going to work? Can we make it work successfully for the safety of everybody? So then we talked about in our forums about transportation. To this Board of Education, we'll talk more, but this idea of courtesy busing is coming more and more to reality for us as we look at that, but we'll explain more to you on the specifics. We still don't want to, we want to make sure kids don't have hazards on their way to school, but convenience might be a thing of the past when it comes to busing. We're looking at 22 to 32 kids on a bus, but here's the important part. Here's the survey. Look at these numbers for elementary school. The elementary school families are saying only a quarter of the kids will be on those buses. And in middle school, 40%, in high school, 36%. That's a huge difference because now, now think, if those are all the numbers are, and we're splitting the kids into groups, we won't need to hire any more buses. We might even be able to save a little there if this all plays out. But this would require parents to do the thing next, which is a waiver. There's a state waiver where you can give up your seat for a period of time. We're going to look to employ that. Right now, we have 30% of our families in elementary saying they'll sign it, 42% in the middle, and a third in the high school. If those numbers stay true and the numbers on the taking the bus stay true, we will be in adequate shape for busing, probably at that 22, closer to the 22 mark, not the 32 mark. But we're leaving it open to be able to go to 32. And masks will be required from um, when they, as soon as they board the bus, they have to be on a mask. They can't board a bus without a mask. And then um, this is a big one. So I'm getting a lot of these, the what if questions. So we want to know, we want to tell the family we're making an FAQ, but these are the two big ones. Uh, this is my child, my child's teacher, or a student in my child's class, somebody tests positive, what happens? It's a big question. And the other one is, how does my child get educated if my child's under a mandatory quarantine? So these are real questions. Um, all of this is being worked on so that parents will see the answers, a big FAQ. I don't even know how many questions we have right now in the FAQ, but uh, Marianne Murphy, uh, my assistant is, I think that's all she's doing right now is is feeding, is, is weeding through that and categorizing and, and combining and um, it's an undertaking. But um, that's kind of where we are. Uh, wasn't doing a lot today. I just wanted to give everyone an update again. And if the board had any specific questions, um, I can field some questions real quick. I have, Mr. I have questions. Go too. ahead, Deborah. All right, so Mr. Feder, uh, in your transportation survey, I just need a clarification. So can you go back to that slide? Okay, so taking the bus will be, let's see, for elementary 26% and Wavier is 30%. So uh, if the, what's the number between? Uh, so it's like a 60, so what, what, what's going on with 40% of kids? They are, what they're doing? Well, the, the, what the survey asked, are you going to put your kid on a bus? Right, and they said no. Middle school parents said yes. Okay, so okay, so that's hundred percent of, of all three uh, models. So each each is different. So the, I broke it up by by level. Okay. We bus we bus by level. So okay. in looking at how we bus, we want to get an idea: do we have a problem or do we not have a problem? Okay. And it looks like we don't have a problem as far as if we run all of our buses normal routes like normal. It doesn't seem like we'll be overcrowded on the buses where we have to then buy more buses to break up the routes. Okay, gotcha. All right. Okay. okay. Thank you. Plus, yep. in addition to that, those people not taking it, if you're running A and B days, you can drop the numbers even more. Right. That's what happens. So it's not only that you have, it's not that you're still going to bus 40%, you're only going to bus 20% because you're splitting that 40% into half because they're coming on different days. So we, all, all the survey was just to see our, what are we really looking at? And so now that we kind of know, we can go about our business in transportation without worrying very 
severely of how am I going to bus all these kids with social distancing measures on these buses? It feels like if we go up to 32 kids, which I don't know that we'll even have to, we should be in good shape. But until we get waivers signed, you, you know, if people don't sign the waiver, we might have to expend money there and lose money on educating kids. So the importance of signing the waiver, if you're not going to use the bus, sign the waiver actually lets us not calculate that seat. If people just don't sign the waiver and then just never put the kid on the bus, we've still calculated the need for that seat. And that costs the district a lot of extra money for something that will never be used. That's why we're going to look for the waivers. Lisa. Do you have a question? Yeah, two. One clarification, two question. One clarification to Devin's point, <clears throat> pardon me, if we have elementary right now at 3026, the other 40% say, are saying they don't know yet. Correct? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So we well, could add another 40% to no, no, taking no. the bus. Yeah, or it's, actually, but, not, it's but, not quite. But what about yeah. the walkers? Yeah, we have those well, people. Other people wrote that they're walkers. Well, they never right. in the first place. Right. They, so so we could act. Is that not that they don't know, that they don't do bus at all? It was a small number, but it does increase the possibility of more. But what I'm saying, these numbers are showing us, because we know our numbers. What I'm just telling you is based upon the numbers from the survey, based upon splitting the kids, we're not anticipating needing more buses. That's all I can tell you without getting too crazy into the math. Okay. Now, regarding, okay. And let, me, let me jump to high school for a second and then I'll come back to the waiver. Um, regarding high school, right now we only allow seniors to drive. Will we consider opening up driving to juniors that can and seniors? Consider, yes, we have to look into it and make sure there's no other issue with it. But again, with less kids, it might be not it might be a non-issue okay and then finally on the waiver itself when you say um we want to sign the waiver right we want people to sign the waiver like, what is it that you're actually requiring or requesting parents to do or what will they have well, we, we didn't do it yet we didn't do it yet so right so okay not, so we don't have the specifics no no we do no we have the specifics it's a state waiver what we'll do is we'll put out the waiver to families have them read it. We'll give them a timeline that they're signing for. It'll be very clear. It'll say, you get for maybe let's go first marking period. You're making the commitment to not okay. use the bus for the first marking period. That's how we'll go about, you know, something like that, where we'll pick a time frame and they give up their seat, which means, you know, absent of an emergency situation, which could happen to somebody, mm -hmm. that in your mind, we deal with it then. Like we're not looking to hurt anybody. We just want to be able to. We want to be able to afford school. <laughs> so, you know, if people aren't using the bus, it helps us in this particular circumstance. We don't ever ask for a waiver other times. Right. This, this is crazy time. So during crazy time, we need to ask crazy questions. And one of them is, if you're not going to use the bus, please sign this so we can manage transporting our kids. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Uh, Scott, you can answer it. Maybe Ray, you can jump in on this too. So if this happens, this scenario happens, and we don't need bus companies, and we're using our buses, and it happens to vary the same way to vary districts uh, throughout the state, what happens next year when things go back to normal and the bus companies are not there anymore. So this model we're talking about includes the bus companies. Oh, uh, okay. We don't need to hire more than we are uh, okay. expecting to do. Okay. That's all. It, it, it's really, what I'm really just telling you. Oh, uh, okay. I'm misunderstood. Enough, okay. Is the survey results inform us that we can go about our business without spending more money, which was a giant fear in the beginning. Uh, uh, okay. Okay. No, right. Okay. Never mind. What the fear would be is if that 26 in the elementary school right. that number were higher and there were people that were planning on taking the bus, if they were right. at 80%, now we're in trouble because we don't have enough room. So we have 
you're looking for. Art. That's when you just have to make the decision to say there's been a fortune or there's no social distancing on the buses. And right. The capacity, and if you don't like it, don't, don't put your kid in a bus. We prefer not well, to say I, that. I actually heard Murphy, the question went to Governor Murphy, and he like, well, you know, if you know how to answer, you kind of made a face. You really can't social distance unless there's only one or two pe kids on the seat. So uh, even at that point, you're kind of not social distancing because the bus driver is still on top of everybody. I think so he has to probably read, you might want to read the DOE guidance. <laughs> Mr. Feder, I just have a one very quick question. Yeah, and go ahead, George. Okay, thank you. I'm just um, wondering roughly what date are we looking at for parents to make these decisions about the bus um, and maybe even about remote learning or, you know, sending their children to school? We Rough have, um, yeah, we have, we have two meetings coming up. We have tomorrow and Tuesday. I would say after Tuesday, we'll be able to start asking the questions and getting our numbers and start moving forward with all that. And you'll be sending um, information to parents how? Just by emailing them or? Usually what, what we do is we send it out on email. Might go out on Nixle, we do a Facebook, we tweet it. I mean. So you put everything covered, right? You're they around. won't get it. Yeah, if people are hiding from information, they won't get it. Thank Any you. other questions? Maybe one suggestion, uh, Mr. President. Yeah, we can have a, 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 the automated voice message by you. Saying, I can do a robocall as well. Yeah, sure. robocall saying that email is coming. Look for it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I like doing them anyway. They're fun, so that's good. <laughs> you haven't had one in a while. Uh, day, since it's snow, there was no snow day, so you didn't get to do it. Thank you, Scott. You're very welcome, guys. Uh, uh, I'm okay. going to stop sharing. Thank you. Okay. It's amazing. We still have 167 people on the call, by the way. Okay, moving along. Uh, uh, board committee reports. Uh, Devin and uh, uh, Arthur, I know your committees have met if you want to just mention it and what what you might have spoken about and that kind of thing. Uh, you sure. sure thank you mr president so curriculum committee meeting twice in the last couple of weeks but i'll just go over june 23rd meeting and mm -hmm. by the way those meetings like jen said are on our board portal for your review or questions or anything but mm -hmm. many things we discussed uh, on June 23rd was a uh, wrap up of remote uh, learning uh, this year and the staff advisory on remote for next year. And there was an advisory group that were set up by Jen and Scott and I was uh, part of those groups. So I saw all uh, uh, discussion at first hand with teachers concerns and everything. And summer and fall, we discussed uh, uh, consideration and planning for the fall uh, sessions. Personalized learning was launched during last week of school, I mean, uh, last week of June. And this launch was presentation and the next step for summer and fall. Culture, cultural competency, that's an important topic right now in the uh, township. Uh, so we are looking to uh, like a covert uh, systematic changes for all admin and staff regarding culture competencies and overt is visible events, programs, actions that keep culture competition in front of our mind uh, <clears throat> and out there. So what we did, we shared some action plan that we will uh, create an advisory council, administrator book study, stamped racism, anti-racism, uh, and you, that's the book, uh, and then uh, district book study, uh, and then one faculty meeting a month for, for this work and parent academy sessions, new staff training, PD sessions and formulate interview questions that are asked at every level. So those things were discussed at the curriculum uh, committee meeting on June 23rd and June uh, on July 13th, uh, we had a meeting too, but I'm going to share that meeting minutes uh, during our next uh, 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 meeting uh, in August, but uh, if you have comments, those are on the board portal. So if you have any comments, just let me know, or Jen know, and we'll, uh, we'll answer those questions too. That's about it, Mr. President. Thank, Thank you, Seven. Arthur, I know we have first reading tonight, so we just had a meeting tonight. I don't know if you want to mention it or it's up to you. 
Uh, probably what I'd like to do, Mr. President, is it, just to just briefly go through the, the first reads. Uh, the information is actually in the... Uh, uh, okay, so, so let's move to uh, action items and then you can speak. How's that? Okay, okay that's good. That's good. And there is no other committee reports. I'm going to close it, unless Ray, do you you want to say anything about the the uh, Friday committee, the uh, uh, the district reopening committee? I don't know if you wanted to say anything. No, it's still going. Scott, as Scott said, he still have. We have two more meetings scheduled, uh, one tomorrow morning and one Tuesday. It's it's making progress. There's a lot of good feedback. I mean, there two and three hour meetings at times just exchanging ideas. So um, we're getting a lot of good feedback from the parents, from the public, and especially from our staff and, and giving us ideas and what their thoughts are. And so it's going very well. Thanks, Rick. Okay, moving along, can I get a motion for the consent agenda on tonight's meeting? I have yes. questions on the consent agenda. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I have a few. I apologize. In advance. Well, let's make the motion first and then you can answer the question. Okay. That? Can I get a motion to move? So moved by Dr. Parker, second by Mr. Robinson. All in favor? Aye. Uh, okay. Now, Lisa, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, these are in, the first set is in regard to transportation. Um, when we looked at the routes that we awarded, um, if since we're still asking parents to consider driving. Um, how did we come up with, for example, ABC was awarded one route. How do we, did we, were we able to get some type of an assumption put together? How did we decide that? The majority of those routes are, are special education routes. So whether, you know, we have a large number of kids transporting back and forth to school, those are individual routes for kids based on their IEPs. Okay, so moving forward then, based on the needs of the district, um, are we going to base it off the surveys, the route awards? We're, we're, we're developing a transportation um, kind of uh, runs based on the number of kids that we have potentially to transport back and forth to school at any given time. So, you know, when we see, you know, 23% of the elementary school kids uh, riding buses, we'll definitely change our, our runs and routes to, to reflect that. Okay, I just wanted to be clear on that. Um, okay, so then moving on to, I'm going to jump just slightly, David. Uh, moving on to the lease pur purchase, excuse me, through U.S. Bancorp. I think it was with the consortium of, uh, I believe, Hunterdon County. Mm -hmm. um, with that lease corp, excuse me, all right, my throat is killing me. Bancorp. With the U.S. Bancorp lease, um, is there any... If, if there was a possibility to refinance, which that rate was amazing, um, is there any chance to refinance? Is there any penalties if the rate de uh, decreases? Is there any leasing options that become available? Is there anything in the contract that restricts that? <clears throat> yeah, we're, we're not able to, we wouldn't, we wouldn't want to refinance that lease. I think we got the best interest rate possible at the time. And uh, it's just like leasing a, a vehicle. You, you right. can't re, finance your lease on your vehicle, you, you would, it's not possible. Okay, thank you. And um, so now going to the check register, again, towards the buses, did we, I saw that we had to pay, uh, like, uh, I can't think of the names of the companies right now, but um, we paid them for the past usage. Did we receive any relief from them since closure in March? Well, we, we paid out approximately 60% on all of our contracts. Okay. So we we profited. We we received or we retained about forty percent on our on our contracts. Okay, great. Okay, and then um, regarding fire alarms. So when we contract for these fire alarms, and if we're not in school, and we do a hundred percent remote, do we still have to have fire alarms um, testing, if you will? And if we are somewhat in remote, excuse me, in in school, are we putting a plan together for the children that are in the classrooms to do safe testing, especially if there's bad weather conditions? Uniform fire code requires uh, school buildings to have, you know, fire fire alarms tested and fire drills done 
monthly, one a month, and then a um, emergency drill once a month. So without, but even if there's no children in, absolutely. Yes. Okay. Okay. Just wanted to check on that. And, and then fine. my last. So there will be there will be some people in that building as long as there's somebody in that building. We'll have custodians in the buildings. We'll have maintenance guys in the buildings. As long as those buildings are occupied in some sort, we're going to have to do a drill in those buildings. And David, wasn't there a, a meeting last week of all the um, school preparedness to go over all the drills and everything that and the timelines that they have to? I believe it was last week. Yeah, the, our, buildings and grounds, our buildings and grounds department uh, director went to that along with our safety um, coordinator. So those guys are up on top of all that stuff. All, all the drills that are necessary. Okay, and then one final uh, question. Um, it's in regard to student teachers. Um, when we bring student teachers in, what are the requirements for them to be a student teacher? Where do we pull these children, or excuse me, these students from? Are we pulling them from um, mm -hmm. urban districts, from um, just suburban college? You know, where are we pulling them from? Can you answer that one if it's okay? Um, so for student teachers, um, we have um, not a requirement if, if, a, if a school wants to have our teacher, a student teacher be placed as long as we have a place to place them. Um, we have put a concerted effort during our talent development on the strategic plan to um, capitalize on more colleges. For a very long time, we primarily um, were connected to the College of New Jersey and Ryder, and we We've expanded that, and um, we we do have some student teachers from Kane and um, other other places around the state. I think that um, we, on our side, um, put out through Blair Eisman, our professional development supervisor. She makes connections um, with the colleges, and then for them, it's a matter of I, I think convenience for their own locations. Um, but like I said, through that talent development piece, we're trying to expand from a diversity standpoint on getting. Um, uh, teachers to, to represent all of our students. Great. Then thank you. I, and I appreciate I just allowing ask. you to ask the questions. <laughs> thank Lisa, you. I just want to give you a few more schools. Okay. Um, typically, um, Blair has said we've been reaching out to New Jersey City University, Great. Seton Hall, Fairleigh Dickinson, and William Patterson. So we're expanding our, our, um, our connections with some of the other universities. And like Jen said, a lot of it has to do with the distance that some of the students are also willing to travel. But we have opened it up to other schools as well to encourage them to place students in South Brunswick. Excellent. Thank you so much. OK. Just real quick, um, Mr. Nathanson, uh, for Arthur, Arthur and our policy committee, uh -huh. tonight's, tonight's meeting was a review. There's not a first read. So we don't oh, have okay. so it's just a review. Our first read, except for 1648, which will be the uh, corona, the uh, family coronavirus um, right. policy, that'll be on the August 4th meeting. But the rest of these policies, first first read will not be until. Oh, later. OK. I'm sorry. You're right. OK. One other thing. I just wanted to, on the, um, Go ahead, the agenda, uh, in addition to the very valid points that Mr. Federer brought up, at the beginning of the meeting regarding the reopening of schools. I mean, there's a lot of impact and it all re comes down to, he was saying they want us to put sidewalks in and spend money. I mean, just simple things like item 1.2C for our athletic trips, where we're getting bus companies to come in at $243 an hour for a mm -hmm. 59 passenger bus. Well, now we have to socially distance so now we can only put 20 students or 24 students on a 59 passenger bus. So our double, our cost just doubled. So that's a budget impact. You're looking at over $450 an hour to send students on an athletic trip. So there's budget impacts in everything we do. Thanks, Ray. You're correct. Some, some of them, some of them make them cost prohibitive. And yeah. at that point, I can tell you, we're not busing. <laughs> we won't be able to do it. Like, if that's how this plays out, you won't be able to afford it unless you're just going to say, we're not going to do this so we could do this. Or you'll be forcing kids to be on a bus with 54 passengers. 
Well, that's kind of why uh, Elaine said, Scott, right? That at this point, we're not doing anything with uh, middle school because we we got to make sure we can do it at least with the high school. Yeah, we, Correct? Yeah, yeah, we can't even, we haven't even gone there yet. It's not even. Right. Okay. Uh, the consent agenda has been moved in second. Uh, David, roll call, please. Mr. Raymond Keener. Aye. Mrs. Joyce Mehta. Aye. <laughs> Dr. Stephen Parker. Aye. Guys, you got it on mute. No. We got to hear you. It's a recording, right? Yeah. Aye. Got <laughs> Mr. Kevin Patel. Aye. Mr. Arthur Robinson. Yes. This is Lisa Rogers. Yes. Mr. Joseph Scaletti. Yes. Mr. Barry Nathanson. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Okay, moving on. Board comments and communication. Anybody have any comments? Lisa, you made your comments ready, so you don't have to. <laughs> okay, moving along. I get a, a motion to adjourn. Uh, and move into executive. Uh, move to executive, sorry. Be resolved, let, I gotta put my glass. Be resolved that the Board of Education of Township in South Brunswick here moves to go into executive session in accordance with Sunshine Law, Chapter 231 of the Public Laws in 1975, NJSA 10-4-6 through 10-4-21 to discuss the filing, its personnel, be it further resolved that the discussion conducted in executive session can be disclosed to the public at a time as this matter has been resolved, formal actions may be taken at any meeting. Can I get now a motion to adjourn to executive? Moved by Mrs. Matter, I have a second. Second by Mr. Robinson. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. I want to thank everybody that attended this evening. Uh, we are definitely in uncharted waters. Uh, I, again, I want to thank my senior staff, all our senior staff, David Pulaski, Scott Fetter, uh, Jennifer Denzer, and Kim White. Uh, they were on, uh, so, uh, you know, I heard someone told me, oh, uh, everybody's on Zoom, so it's a lot easier. Well, they probably had like a five minute break today to go to the bathroom and that's probably about it. So, so I, I have to thank them. And I continue to thank all our staff that are working really hard. Like Ray said, that, you know, you, uh, most of the uh, township doesn't see them working, the teachers, the secretaries, the, the paras, the custodians, uh, the bus drivers are getting involved. Everybody's involved from top to bottom and, and just they're doing an amazing job. And it's just, it, it's gonna be uh, a, it's gonna have to be a team effort. And, and oops, Scott almost fell off his couch. Uh, it, it has to be a team effort uh, because we're not going to be able to get this done, but I have faith in this district and I know we can get it done. Whatever shape or form, e-learning, e mix, whatever it is, you know, we're going to get it done. So I want to thank South Brunswick. Uh, South Brunswick, good night and stay safe.